I'm Nina Berman. I'm in New York City. I'm in my apartment building and currently workers are doing a little bit of construction out in the hallway so you might hear some of that. So I was born here in New York City. I've been a photographer about 30 years. I went to college in Chicago and I spent most of my life here in the United States working a little bit um, in Europe and Asia and Central America. Originally, I grew up wanting to be a writer. I'm a kind of New York Times foreign correspondent, writer, reporter. And um, that was my dream for quite a long time. And then I had a camera when I was about 17, 18. And over time, I felt as though that the photography was more creatively challenging for me and that I could communicate ideas that might not be so permitted in words. I realize I have a capacity to listen to people without judging them, and that's what I do as part of my picture taking. So in some ways, my, this work, an autobiography and this wish, fits into that thread. I started this project in 1990, having no idea that it would last for nearly half my life. Uh, it began in London. I was relatively new to professional photojournalism, and I went to London with this kind of vague idea of photographing the end of Maggie Thatcher's rule. Tonight, the key to 10 Downing Street lies in the hands of her party. She led them to victory three times, then they turned on her. The Thatcher era is over. She had been Prime Minister of the UK and had established certain economic policies that were leading to income inequality. Police battled Molotov cocktail throwing protesters on many city streets as joblessness stood at 2.7 million. Her legacy on economic issues remains divisive, with some arguing her policies sowed the seeds for the 2008 financial crisis. Hit her what she stood for, hit her what she did to do uh, us. She has, a, she has a legacy, a legacy of destruction, a legacy of destroying lies. Her strategy of defying the Keynesian consensus by hiking taxes and launching a monetarist attack on inflation plunged the economy even deeper into recession. And as a result, there were a lot of, lot of street kids in London at the time. And I just became interested in them and started photographing them. I met one girl who at the time called herself Kathy Wish. I was in London and um, I was trying to get into the shelter. It was dark, wet, and um, I was banging on the door, desperately trying to get in. Uh, there was a lot of other kids sitting around on the sidewalk and um, I turned around I saw you and um, you had lots of big bags and all these cameras and um, I was really intrigued by you so I just asked you, talked to you and asked you where you were from and um, when you said America, that was it. I was like, wow, that's cool, that's really cool. I liked Kathy. She was she was bright and creative and we kind of hit it off and we would laugh and and so when I left I said, "Well, here's my address and phone number. If you want, you can write me some letters, you know, stay in touch, take care of yourself. Bye-bye." And um and she would write me some letters. She would call collect on the phone sometimes. And then one day she called and said, that she had won a contest for homeless kids. She played piano on television and won a bunch of money. I didn't really know whether to believe it or not. I've since found out that it's absolutely true. Um, but she had won a bunch of money and she wanted to come to visit New York or, or that she was gonna come to visit New York and she could she drop in and see me and maybe stay for a couple days. Frankly, I didn't see anything wrong with that. So she came to my apartment and I showed her around the city, she had a lot of fun. And then while sleeping in my kitchen on a cot, one afternoon she had a nightmare. And I started photographing her nightmare. And then I stopped and I thought, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Um, this is like, I don't, you know, no one's running this story anyway. And like, why am I even doing this? So I put the camera away 
And then the next day she had a flashback and I'd never seen someone have a flashback and she started hallucinating and didn't know where she was and I lived on the eighth floor. I was afraid she might jump out of the apartment. And um, so when she came out of the flashback about 15 minutes later, mm -hmm. I felt like I couldn't, I felt unsafe having her in my apartment. I didn't know how to help her. And so I encouraged her to go back to England like before her time was up, you know, before her trip was supposed to end. And I helped her go back to uh, get to the airport and I encouraged her to get some psychological help. And so, and then, you know, we, we, we kept uh, trading letters and she started to send me things, uh, pages of her diaries and drawings. And I just keep them in my apartment thinking, oh, you know, maybe she'll want them one day or I don't know why she's sending them to me. And, and, um, and I stopped seeing it as any kind of journalism story. And I went on with my career, you know, I was doing things. The conventional definition in the U.S. This is a convention that's been carefully arranged by the National Institute of Drug Abuse is that addiction is a brain disease. Dr. Mark Kleeman, professor of public policy at New York University. In fact, it's a chronic relapsing brain disorder. Um, and I think that is an important half-truth. Um, the other half of the truth is that bad habit is a universal part of the human condition. We all have behavior patterns that we'd rather not have. We don't always want the things we would want to want if we could control ourselves. So it's possible to get a bad habit about almost anything. Uh, Imelda Marcos famously had a bad habit around buying shoes. The wife of the Philippine dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, she's said to have had up to 3,000 pairs before the couple were ousted from office. So on this account, I want to say the brain disease claim is perfectly understandable and, and again, at some level true. A disease is an unwanted condition of the mind or body that's involuntary and unusual. Most people don't have it. So somebody with a bad habit um, has something that looks a lot like a disease. Um, so I think that it's the description brain disease and the description bad habit are equally good descriptions of the same phenomena. What's problematic in my view is the notion that if something is a brain disease, it is now completely escaped volition. And that's simply false. That's demonstrably false. Take somebody who's addicted to a drug and put them in a setting where a certain amount of effort is required to obtain the drug um, and vary the amount of effort. The more effort that's required, the less of the drug that person will use. So if that's the nature of the problem, what does that mean about policy? Our economic and political systems are built around the notion of consumer choice. Not that people always make decisions that are in their own interests. That would be a foolish thing to think. But that most people, most of the time on most topics, make better decisions in their own interests that could be made for them by some outside force, in particular by public policy. To call something a temptation good is to deny that it belongs in that category. Right? If, if temptation is a central phenomenon around the consumption of some good, then making policy toward it as if most people most of the time made good choices is going to get it wrong, importantly wrong. It's especially problematic because, again, only a minority of drug users at any one time have a substance use disorder but people with substance use disorder consume a lot of their favorite drug 
one of the most important generalizations in economics is what's called sometimes called Pareto's law or the 80-20 law. 20% of the participants in any activity will account for 80% of the actual activity. That's the reason airlines have frequent flyer programs. The minority of people who are on the road a lot use most of the air travel. The minority of people who drink too much use most of the alcohol. In the US, about a third of adults don't drink at all. So people who have at least two full drinks of alcohol a day on average year round account for 80% of the sales of beer, wine, and spirits. Which means that if you're in the alcohol business, you're fundamentally in the alcohol problem business. The responsible drinkers that your ads say you want to encourage won't support your activity. You need to appeal to and cultivate people with drinking problems. Good afternoon, I'm sorry to bother you guys, I really am. My name is Kimberly, I'm a homeless person. Please, if anybody happens to have any spare food or water that you no longer want anymore, I would be so grateful for that. The actual drug use, the putting of the crack in the pipe, I'm sorry, I don't really care about those pictures. I don't understand why people are always photographing the act of getting high. It's so much more than just, you know, smoking cracks, you know, injecting heroin, popping pills. It's like, why are people doing it? And that's the, so my book is about trauma and addiction as a byproduct. And then, um, you know, how addiction maybe can lead to HIV and other sicknesses. And then how you become, how that trauma is criminalized and certainly in a place like the United States where we have these very draconian, harsh drug laws. So I think that journalists often think, and photographers especially, think that because they can see something that they have to always show it. You know, just because you witness something doesn't mean you have to photograph it. Or even if you photograph it, it doesn't mean you have to publish it. And that what you decide not to publish is equally as important at what, as what you decide to publish. Streets, being a female, it's not easy at all. Right now, I'm really relying on you guys for your help and support. If anyone also has any information or advice that can help me, I would truly appreciate hearing that too. It's not easy doing this. I mean, right now, I feel so embarrassed. But if I don't do this, I really don't get any help. So anything at all that you could do to help me in any way, I would be sincerely grateful for that. I honestly would. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thank you. God bless you. Take care. Anybody else? So I think that what happens with other depictions of addiction or mental illness is that people can, documentarians, photographers, journalists, maybe because of time or format or publication constraints tend to um, simplify the stories and turn people into one-dimensional characters. And this has a danger of perpetuating stigmatizing stereotypes. So this is my problem with um, a lot of pictures I've seen of addiction. And as far as Kim um, is concerned, that's one reason why I didn't include um, pictures of her smoking crack or pictures of her selling herself, or pictures of her, you know, in the most out of control moments. I kept like sort of pulling back. And, and I would ask her many times, Kim, are you sure you want to do this? Do you want to do this? Well, I, I, cause I need to know why, because I'm going to be out there in the world defending this book. And I need to know why. I think we should do that more often. We should know their intentions and their expectations. And often we're told, well, we sh- we are these sort of overseeing authorities, you know, privileged eyes who come in and, and have this capacity to analyze and dissect the world in front of us. And we shouldn't really hear from the people that we're photographing. This is like old colonial practice. Often, at great personal and physical risk, 
Jim goes where others desperately try to flee out of the belief that the only way to stop the suffering is by bearing witness to it. It is my great, great privilege and honor to present Jim Noctua, who's here tonight. We have the example of Time magazine and their, their opioid diaries, which were published in where were we? March 2018. Critic and visual communications expert Stephen Mays. Uh, it was a, a piece by um, you know, noted celebrity photographer James Nathway. And uh, it was an astonishing statement by the magazine where they cleared out all their advertising. They ran 60 pages of, of black and white photography with very little textual text intervention. I mean, it was really an astonishing commitment by the magazine. Um, but a you know, deeply flawed piece of coverage focused on basically homeless people or certainly life on the streets and uh, it, it interface with the, with the cops. As I learned photographing wars, statistics are an abstraction. To even begin to understand the reality of the situation, it's necessary to see what's happening to individual people one by one. As a photographer, I knew it was time to revisit my own country. What I discovered is an American nightmare. I mean, the, the, only, the only institutional uh, contact between the users and any other form of um, authority were with the police. It seems that, you know, Nashway just drove around to the cops and uh, may have jumped out of the car occasionally to take pictures of people on the streets, which is not really a full representation of how the opioid crisis is is killing 60,000 people a year in, in North America. It's happening mainly in people's living rooms. It's happening you know, inside homes. It's happening inside families with very little police contact at all. So in, you know, in, in reportage terms, it's a, it's a somewhat flawed um, reportage. But being in Time magazine and being such an impactful and powerful presentation, it does affect change. Maybe the standards vary when you're talking about affecting change and of honesty of, of coverage. It's the wish of everyone at time that this publication creates a heightened level of awareness within our population at large and also among decision makers, that the national dialogue about this crisis will be advanced and the more effective ways of dealing with it will be initiated. The, the Time magazine piece was, if you like, partially honest, because the lives of those people are very real. Uh, naturally didn't invent them, uh, but it's very incomplete. But that may not matter if the outcome of that is to reach the policymakers that uh, Time magazine was hoping to reach. By and large, I was impressed by their intelligence and their ability to articulate what was happening to them. Instead of hiding from the camera, people thanked me for doing the story. We don't need to work this way anymore. And so I really hope that the book, when presented to journalistic audiences and photographic audiences, that this is one of the lessons and one of the conversations that will help spark is that there are different ways to do documentary photography and you can do it in a way that's truly collaborative. And that's really important because I never would have done this book and I never would have published any pictures and I didn't publish any pictures. I never dropped any images into my agency archive. I never offered images up as like single pictures. Oh, here I got a picture of an addict. Do you want to publish that? I never did anything like that. And I would never have published this work if it wasn't a collaboration and if it wasn't equally, you know, Kim's um, output and creative output. You had taken a picture, and um, I think you said it was your favorite picture, and you had sent it to me in the mail, and it it was a real picture. I was smiling, and I think, and and it looked really good. It made me look really good, and it was not staged, and and it, and I really like that picture today, to this day. I'm outside the shelter, and I'm. Um, of course, it rains a lot in England. So I had a big pla black plastic bag and I was putting my sleeping bag in it to keep it dry. And you took a picture and, and I, was, I was proud of that picture. I, I actually felt, I didn't feel degraded or embarrassed. I felt proud and happy. So, some of them are, are like, Oh, poor you, which I don't really like because I think I'm very strong. 
And some of them are like, this is remarkable, and look where you're at now, and you made it through, and you're strong. You know, because I don't like to be seen as a victim. So, but if you read the book from the beginning to the end, you you would have full knowledge and you wouldn't see me as a victim. You'd see me as a survivor. So we have Nita Bowman's story with, with Kim, which is really, I, I have to say, I saw Nina talking with Kim, uh, which was just one of the most powerful experiences I've had in a, in a long while, because there was no artifice, there was no pretense. Uh, there were both sides of the story being presented with equal vigor, uh, at both sides. It was the same story. It wasn't even both sides of the story. It was the same story from two perspectives. Um, and that, that was really so enlightening because that was where one can talk about a, a documentary maker having a particular line of inquiry or a you know, particular uh, angle that they want to grind. Uh, here were two people talking about the same issue, the same circumstances, at, you know, which were happening at the same time, but from two different perspectives. And that, to me, made it, makes it almost unique that the opportunity to, to have two perspectives on exactly the same moments, on exactly the same history, it clears away a lot of the, 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 um, uh, the, the doubts one might have about the storyteller's perspective and their, their, the judgments that they're bringing. You know, we are so used in this world to having you know, the, the teller and the uh, protagonist as being separate. You know, this, this is my telling of your story. However sympathetic, it is, you know, we, we are molded into this, this way of working, which is, you know, we are separated somehow. Um, and that Nina and Kim have completely short-circuited that process by, by very honestly recounting the same story, but from their different perspectives. And it is, they are different perspectives, there's no doubt about it. They have different understandings of what they're talking about. But both those understandings are valid, uh, both apply to the same situation, and by seeing them both at the same time, one has this extraordinary insight then into some form of truth. And I'm very conscious of, of, of late of um, you know, much of what Nietzsche said, that it's, there, is no, you know, there is no truth, there is only interpretation. Um, and you know, facts alone don't, don't tell us what truth is. It, it is all about, you know, truth is all about interpretation. And having these two interpretations of the one factual circumstance, I think it has to bring us closer to a form of truth. I like to prove people wrong. I love that. Because when I, I do the same thing, and then when I learn and when people teach me the, the way I'm thinking is wrong, I'd be like, wow, you're right. You should decide. And do you want to go in there to prove something to someone else? Or, or do you, you want just to go in there and play piano? Just to go and play piano. Then yeah. What yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, maybe I could do both. Right. Right? 